Man, what's this? What? Oh, <laughs> goodness. It's perfect. Hang in there, mate. This was one of the more intense experiences. Hang in there, mate. Helps on its way. And he was just screaming in pain. Screaming. I felt really, really helpless. Good morning. Oh, yeah. So for 10, 11 months of the year, the southeasterly winds pushes all from the Pacific Ocean straight up onto weather facing beaches like this. So we're going to start up here, work our way, you know, the, the K or so down there and back, see what we can find. So all this rubbish that's floated up onto these beaches, this is just one of tens of thousands of beaches in the world. Imagine what's not getting seen that's just getting thrown into the ocean or finds its way into our water systems that sinks. That's pretty, pretty frightening, eh? There's big plastic floats absolutely everywhere. Honestly, hundreds of them. No glass bubbles. I'll keep looking. That's reusable. Nice. A bit cracked. Nautilus shell. What's your winnings for the morning, mate? Yeah, mate, these are my little treasures here. I've um, scored us a little nut jar, which we're pretty proud of, because um, yep, our, nuts are going, our nuts are going everywhere through the boat. This old torch, I'm going to forge it into a coffee jar, and I think I've found the slipper I was looking for. To Gucci go, too. A Gucci one, mate, to match the Adidas. And if we want to do some hard work... you got a hard hat. Yeah, that's right. You've got a monstrous mosquito on your left cheek. Slap oh. it. Oh, a little bit of blood in it too. Oh man, let's get moving to the next beach. Treasure of the day. I left my toothbrush at the hotel back in Cairns. Five days later, I've scored one. And for five days he hasn't? Just finger brush? Yeah, a bit of a finger. <laughs> a bit of a finger brush. <laughs> Bro. Greg just freaked out. As we're looking for the bubbles. Wow. But it was just this. That was close. So close. Mate, your enthusiasm was second to none. <laughs> Jump to action. Oh, there's so much, so much washed in this big tidal zone. That's a pretty cool bottle though. That's a sick bottle. My bubble, mate. <laughs> what we're doing, we're just scanning. Greg and I are probably like 10, 15, 20 meters apart and doing grid searches where we'll walk up the beach on the high tide mark. But then there's been previous high tides that have pushed up into this like little like swampy gutter a lot of pumice stone and with it all the desirable so floats on the floats we're getting these stainless clips which come in really handy in the boat also really old bottles lures nautilus shells and yeah anything else we can find and, and recycle or yeah treasure essentially what's the main thing we're looking for today as is a glass bubble glass bubbles were essentially the floats between like 1910 and the like, second world war until they transitioned to plastic they come in all shapes and sizes all different colors. I've never found one. I've looked for thousands and thousands of miles over the last decade, never found one. So pretty prime spot here, but as you can see, there's lots of pumice stone, like that volcanic pumice stone, potentially meters thick. Man, what's this? What? This is a canoe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dugout canoe. You're oh. kidding me. Oh. Oh, what? Oh man, it's perfect. Look at the finish. Oh man, look, that's in just, brand new nick. This has floated a long, a long, long way. Look, it's been sitting there for a while. All that stain is, is arguably better than a glass bubble. Wow, look how smooth it is. I'm sort of lost for words, but that's why we beach comb. That's the allure of beach comb, because like around every corner, you never know what you're going to find. Like that's insane, man. Beautifully done too. As a, as, a, workmanship, yeah, as a carpenter, how's the finish? What do you reckon? Oh mate, it's, it's very beautiful. The craftsmanship's amazing. What, this would be a one person though. Oh, it depends how big the person is. So there's signs here. They could have had outriggers on it. They would have needed to, to balance it. Yeah, unreal. Wow. You're gonna, go, you're gonna stand on this side? Yeah. And just roll it up like that. All right. Ready? One, two, three, up. Oh. You good? Yeah, you. Yep. You wanna swap shoulders? Now we'll get it in the water and we'll float it over. You ready? This is insane, man. How weighted is it? It's perfectly weighted. We've decided the dugout canoe treasure's coming with us and we're trying to work out exactly how we mount this onto the boat. We're thinking the roof. Oh. 
Can you get it on that edge? Just bring it down. <laughs> That's us. That's us right there. Yeah. So good. Wow. Oh, that's wild. That is beautiful. So we had 70 miles more to travel today. And in the excitement of getting the dugout canoe on the roof, the tide's gone out and we're, yeah, we're high and dry for the next five hours. It's almost lunchtime. We can't get the boat out. I just checked the tides till 5 p.m. So it sort of puts us a day behind. I don't, yeah, we'll play it by you with how the weather goes, but not much we can do about it. So we have grabbed a rod. We're gonna go for another beach comb, see if we can catch something on the line on the lure. So while the tide is really high and I got access to these really long white sandy beaches on the coast, thought I'd come for a bit of a beach comb and a flick of a lure and a couple of these creeks while, while there's a bit of water in them. And so far I've found a couple of useful items, some pretty intact plastic buckets, which are always good for the boat, and a lifetime supply of stainless steel shark clips. But I just need to share with you what I found. And it's pretty much, it looks pretty much perfect. A big Nautilus shell, ancient Nautilus shell. Look at that, have a go at it. It's just such a treasure. Yeah, there's another one. A little bit cracked. No, it's too damaged. I'll leave that there. But that one's, that one's coming home for the bookshelf. I'm stoked with that. Oh, what have I got? What is that? Oh, little trolley. Oh, in fact, like six others following. I'll be honest with you, current situation is extremely hot. Definitely not to plan. That's not the reality of these trips. It's not to plan. And also we've got a no complaining policy on this trip and neither of us are allowed to complain. If the other person complains, I need to buy him a cocktail when we get back to civilization. That's the current deal. Through all this sand, heap of tracks though. So I'm keen to see, yeah, that's a cow. It's a big print. It's only within the last day. So there's definitely some wild cattle around here. We've just come around this next corner. There's five cows. I was warned that the scrub bulls one-on-one -on -one will go you and to get away from him you can't run, you gotta climb up a tree, so. Uh, they're running, they're all wary. Who has that, that little one right on the edge of the sand up on the beach? Dude, it looks like a bomb. It's not a float, or it might have been a float and something's broke off it. Okay. Aluminium float. Boom! Oh man, I thought from a distance it could have been a glass one. Oh, what have you found? Craig's just yelling out to me on this previous I oh man. Glass bubble. The remnants of one. Where was it just here? It's right here. It's right here. There's one with it. We dug down, I don't know. Oh man, bugger. Search continues. I know it's probably the last thing you want to do right now, mate, but can you briefly talk through how you feel? Just a bit cooked, mate. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for anyone watching, we've just spent like four or five hours in the hottest of Australian sun in soft sand. If you haven't spent a bucket load of time in really humid tropical conditions like this in the last year or two, it rolls you. I, even myself, I feel proper lightheaded. So we're just sitting in the boat having some shade, having some water, having some electrolytes, and just like putting a bit of the, it is fresh water over our foreheads and all that, so. No, there's one turtle. No, they're all rays. Holy, they're huge. Hang it in there, mate. Yeah, mate. I've been in the boat for the last probably three and a half hours tending to Greg and just making sure he's sipping water, electrolytes, and putting uh, like a wet, cool wet towel over his like forehead, neck, groin, and armpits. So apparently that's the go-to. Ice would have been ideal. I'm having a lot of ice, but yeah, sipping water, which I thought you just get as much water in as possible, but that's not the go-to. Really sort of humbling and a great reminder that out here the elements are harsh and I grew up with heat as one of the main environmental conditions. So I'm really used to it, but I really took for granted just how used to it I am. And Greg's come out of a really cold environment where me personally, I really can't handle the cold. I get really cold, really, really easy. So yeah, that's just a reminder to everyone. If you are like whatever environment you're in, I guess, just make sure that you're, you're prepped for it. We trudged around in soft sand, really, really hot, really still for hours today. And we drank water, but obviously just not enough. And 
Yeah, his body overheated. He's starting to come good now, but it was, yeah, I didn't really film much of it because it was pretty full on for a bit there. Like there was an hour where I was trying to work out, is it possible to get a chopper in? How far? You know, it was like 170 miles to the nearest island with any infrastructure and a little airport. So pretty nerve wracking, only a few days in. Need to be really onto it, need to be aware. And at the end of the day, that most important things are getting home safely physical come back alive do my best not to sink the boat the second one doesn't always happen but how you going brother oh. feeling a little bit better been better yeah yeah still a bit lightheaded at all yeah lightheaded dazed yeah yeah still feeling like you want water i have been sipping on the water yeah yeah not really just need to, need to cool down yeah so we set off to an island anchorage for the night. In the back of my mind though, I was aware that extreme heat stroke definitely can kill, but for now anyway, it looked like Greg was on the mend and on the up. So I got the fire going, got some rice cooking, got the mud crabs from the other day still alive. I didn't realize the tide had come in so quick. It's literally like a meter and a half. So it takes the fire. So I'm gonna get these mud crabs on quick smart and have dinner watching this sunset. Big day. <laughs> There's one of the mud crabs we got a couple of days ago. The good thing about catching them live is that they'll keep for a couple of days. Today we didn't catch any fish to eat fresh, so fortunately uh, we've got two of these in the old coffee sack. We've just been dipping in salt water every few hours. So I'm just gonna humanely put a knife in this one, put it to sleep, and then we'll get them on the coals for dinner. All right, rice is done, coals are out. Crabs are ready to go on. You'll see that I just put the knife straight into the middle of the carapace of the crab. Kills it pretty much instantly. I'm just gonna throw them straight on the hot coals. Simple seafood, rice and mud crab. Doesn't get much better than that. You better believe that it's unbelievable. Thank you, crab. After sunset, the next six hours felt like an eternity. Greg took a turn for the worse and started feeling these extreme waves of pain through both his chest and ribs. All right, mate, we're almost there. I'm just gonna try and anchor the boat and then we'll, we'll walk in, all right? And the feeling we had was that this was way more severe than, than heat stroke. We decided to make the difficult decision to set off the EPIRB. Hang in there, mate. Help's on its way. Which I'm so fucking thankful we did. Between the hours of 8 p.m. and 2 a.m., we drove through a rough ocean to get to a beach that professional help could access. Without having emergency comms that night, we honestly would have been in a true nightmare. I don't think I've ever been more relieved than getting Greg into the hands of professional help that night and onto some extremely intense painkillers. And to those first responders, thank you. You're lifesavers. See you in a few days, mate. Lifesavers. I'm gonna do my my best to articulate sort of what just happened this afternoon and tonight. Keeping in mind I, I haven't slept in a couple of days and it's now almost 3 a.m. Greg, after having heat stroke this afternoon, sort of had a bit of a second wind and he came back and he looked, looked like he was sort of joking and laughing and back to his normal self. And then as the sun went down, maybe seven o'clock, he started complaining of really sore tightness in his chest and ribs and like really dehydrated and was just every sort of 10, 15 minutes was getting in more and more excruciating pain. And he got to the point where I'm like, mate, well, mate, what do you want to do? Like it's eight o'clock at night, we're 160 miles away from sort of the, the nearest facilities. Oh, what do we do? And he's like, I'm not saying this lightly, like I'm in trouble and I'm going downhill really fast. Like I'm, I'm in a really bad way. So anyway, then so sort of proceeded the next six hours, which involved us setting off the EPIRB, which I've never done before, which is a, yeah, an emergency beacon. We had a fixed wing aircraft come in circling us and, and helping us. It turned out the nearest help we could get was on a beach, a couple of hours drive, off-road drive to the edge of the coast. And it took me a bit over two and a half hours in the pitch black at night. Greg is sort of coming in and out of consciousness on the back deck. I'm like driving the boat, giving him water, a bit of a cold towel on his head, telling him to breathe, checking his pulse. I feel like imagine having like, one of your best mates there, like sort of just in tears saying like, he's not gonna see us. I just felt so help. <sighs> I felt really, really helpless because I couldn't get the boat into where the, the police were waiting for us. It was just like 
fucking big waves crashing on these rocks and sandbars and we just would have ended up like making the situation so much worse and he's just like fuck it i'm gonna swim i'm gonna swim out to him like i just need to like just just needed help and i just fucking didn't know what to do i was just telling him like breathe calm man breathe calm like you're gonna be all right you're gonna be all right like you're not gonna die you're gonna live like you're gonna see your boy again you're gonna see your family again, you're gonna be right. And yeah, like fucking after what felt like a proper eternity, saw the lights on the beach and I just fucking up in the boat. I got intel it was all sand on the VHF and uh, just rode the, the boat up onto the sand where I am now. I'm literally just sitting on the bottom. I don't know if you can hear it, but I'm just sitting on sand and rubble at the moment, waiting another three hours for the tall sunrise. The tide will come up enough for me to work out where I'm gonna go and what I'm gonna do. But I'm just so happy Greg got to the ambulance and he's stable, he's alive, he's okay. I genuinely thought he was gonna die. Really, really intense. It was one of the more intense experiences I've had on a trip. Fucking running on adrenaline right now, to be honest. It's all pretty raw. But anyway, it was testing. It's good. It's part of why we, we love doing this, you know. Tested things out tonight, you know, driving and how rough it was that night, trying to deal with someone who was dying. So I uh, haven't found out what exactly is, you know, is wrong. Could be appendix, and gallstones, could be, you know, a byproduct of severe dehydration, could be an Irukandji sting, could be something else. I have no idea. But I'm just going to ride it out the next few hours, try to get some sleep. Yeah, I'm, I'm just grateful Greg is alive. Make sure you, you tell your mates and your family you love them. And uh, stay safe out there. I know I need to be because I'm, I'm a solo chummy out here by myself by myself again I'm just gotta get home another few hundred miles a few hundred miles to get home signing off hey guys just recently i got offered to go on a journey of a lifetime with a really good friend of mine now myself and my son are humongous fans of back to basic every time a new episode comes out at night the storybook goes down the telly comes on and we're immersed in it we love watching uncle Azzy boy fran and strick all do their thing so when i had the opportunity to get on the other side of the screen to show my son that in years to come, these are the adventures he's gonna be going on with his father. I jumped at it, it'd be rude not to. The initial part of my journey was incredible. Everything I thought it would be and more. I was diving, we were fishing, we were camping. I was catching up with a great friend. We were solving all the world's problems around a fire. It was awesome. The second part of my journey though, it turned south very quickly, it turned for the worse. Initially, we thought it was heat stroke. I think it was, I think that's what triggered the pancreatitis. And it was the most excruciating pain, the scariest time of my life. But Uncle Azzy boy, Az Gallagher, saved my life. If it wasn't for him and the actions he took under very stressful situations. I'm now back at safety. I've spent six days at the Cairns Hospital, which is adjacent to the airport. I'm hoping to go home tomorrow to see my family and hold my boy. I really hope I can, I can get out of here tomorrow. So there's a lot to learn out of this. I don't want to drag this on too much. There's a lot to learn, but the biggest thing he did for me that day was as a friend, as a human being, he got down on my level and he told me I wasn't dying there, even though I, I was 100%, mate. I was gone. I was, I was out. I was done. He got down on my level. He showed me photos of my, my boy, my woman, my family, and got me through it. Big love to Az. Big love to Back to Basics. Big love to Fran, Strick, Jack. I love you guys. Peace. Hope they'll be home soon. I'm happy to report that Greg is now back to his adventurous, mischievous, and hardworking self. He's focusing on a renewed sense of mental and physical health. He's building houses. He's being the best dad possible to young Billy Barramundi. He's surfing waves in Margaret River and spearfishing his own food each week in the Indian Ocean. And Greg, when you see this, mate, I understand, I really get how challenging, how big it is to be able to share something so personal and that no words or photos or, or, or visuals will do justice to what went down that night. But know that I love you, mate. You're one of the strongest, most capable and rogue and caring blokes that I know. And it's, it's an honor to have you as a mate. And I know for sure that if the roles were reversed that night, you would have no worries done the same for me. Keep in mind, you still owe me a few beers. <laughs>